few reminders before we start. Um, homework two, uh, the grades were posted this morning or late last night or something like that. Um, if you have any questions about your grades, please get in touch with the TA who graded it. You can use the comment box uh, on Canvas and you can have conversations with the TA. Uh, and if you feel like there's something incredibly unfair about your grade, send me a message and I'll see what I can do. Uh, homework four is due today. Uh, it's about computational learning theory. Um, it, depending on your perspective on things, this might be a not so easy homework or a very easy homework. Um, either way, uh, please start after class if you haven't started already. Um, I had a question about that. So I was starting to speak in mind. Okay. Well, there's a question about a circle, and it took me like six hours. Um, the question that had like you have a hypothesis space of circles and like what's the easy yeah 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 and I was kind of like thoroughly mathematically prove it so I have an answer. So you have to make an argument for every VC dimension proof is basically has the same template. Um, you need to con you need to find uh, let me maybe use so there are two sides for the VC dimension proof. So you need to show that if, if suppose you want to prove that VC dimension is some number uh, n, then you need to show two sides. VC is greater than or equal to n, and VC is strictly less than n plus one. These are the, the every proof has to have these two sides to it. Now on this side, you need to show that for no, there there is some Importantly, even one set of size n that can be shattered. Greater than or equal to. It's greater than or equal to. So uh, I make no apologies for my awful handwriting. I hope it's clear though. Uh, I'm trying to read along as I say this. Um, there's also a follow-up question in uh, 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 Zoom. I think it's relevant to this one, so I'll read it out. You can tell me if it's not relevant. How do we know for sure that only certain subsets of size, L, size X, in this case N, can be shattered and others cannot? What class, what qualifies as a certain subset? Is it always points on a line versus points not on a line? That's not the case. Um, the points on a line and points on, it, it depends on uh, what your, uh, the hypothesis space is. So all you need to do is produce one set of points. You know, even if you can produce one set of points that can be shattered, then we see dimension is greater than n. Uh, so in some sense, this is it's, uh, like uh, search for one example, just one example. And in order to sh show this, but to show that it can be shattered, what you need to do is consider Every ah, this is what happens if I only type and every labeling of that set. So every way in which that's the set of points can be labeled, you need to consider that and show that there is one classifier that agrees with that hypothesis. So here the universal quantification is over the labeling. So you need to consider every possible labeling. To show that VC dimension is less than n plus one, you need to show that every set of size n plus one cannot be shattered. Now, the problem is, you can, it, it, this seems like a, a rather difficult thing to do. You need to consider every possible it's an infinite set. How do you show that an infinite, you can't you know, show, how do you prove that this infinite set cannot be shattered? Instead, what you do is you, depending on that hypothesis class, you need to consider uh, uh, like natural equivalence classes. So for the uh, linear classifier case, we considered all three, three uh, to show that three points cannot be shattered, you consider all three points are collinear, uh, no, sorry, four points cannot be shattered. Three of them are collinear or three of them are not collinear. 
This is the only way in which four points can exist on a plane. Now, if three of them are not collinear, you consider uh, the fourth point lies inside the triangle, fourth point lies outside the triangle. These are the only ways in which any four points can exist on a plane. And that takes care of the every part. So you need to consider essentially natural groupings. And this is where it takes some amount of thinking and maybe a few hours uh, of effort. And to show that it cannot be shattered, all you need to do is for given a particular configuration of the points, show one labeling you just need to produce one labeling that cannot be matched so the uh, i'll get to you in a minute the important point is for the greater than proof you need to show one set and consider every labeling for the less than proof you need to consider every set and for each one you need to show just one labeling uh, and this can be a great source of confusion uh, the hardest part really is the sort of some amount of creative effort that's needed to uh, uh, think about how do you characterize every set yes so my follow-up question from that is i i got to this last part where i found i know exactly what's labeling can't be characterized I'm struggling between them. And it seems like we'd buy something to prove by example or prove by picture. Um, so you can, uh, oh wow, there's a lot of questions on Slack, and I'll go over them right after answering this one. Um, so, how do you prove uh, that something cannot be shattered? So, there I, I don't want you to go into like extreme mathematical detail. For instance, just this is an example. If I tell you that these four points cannot be shattered by a linear classifier, what did I do? I said, here is a labeling that cannot be matched. I did not go on to prove formally that no linear classifier can separate this because that will take a lot of effort and uh, uh, you have a 10 page page limit. So this, okay. Um, can I go through the Zoom questions and then I'll come back? Proof by picture is fine, but you need to be careful. Uh, you need to make an argument. In fact, for the examples that you have, uh, for the questions, some of the questions you have, uh, what do you have? You have circles and concentric circles and that weird sort of thing, the two lines, right? For circles, I, I know of a way of writing it without proof by pictures. You can actually prove by argument, really. If such and such configuration happens, then no circle can, uh, and such an, it, it, so, so for instance, for the upper bound, for uh, this side of things, uh, let's say that the set of all n point, n plus one points can be partitioned into type A, type B, type C, type D. In type A, all points have a certain configuration. Now for that, I will label those four points in this way and notice that there is no circle that can exist that contains only the positive point. So, can you say that you have to say why no circle can? Mm, if you can, uh, if it is not obvious. So, in this case, I think it is possible. So, think a little bit carefully. Uh, I'm going to go through the Zoom questions because otherwise I'll lose track. So, is it always the case that if VC dimension is X, sets of size at least X plus one can be completely shattered? Um, sorry, X minus one. If VC dimension is X, then it is the case that all sets of size, not all sets of size, uh, I'm going to use N. So the question is if VC dimension is N, like in this thing here, and I'm showing just N and N plus one, what about N minus one? Can n minus one be shattered? The answer is typically yes. There is at least one set of size n minus one that tends to be shattered. Though I can't remember the function class right now, but there is a certain function class for which we know that the VC dimension is more than a certain number and less than certain other number, and we still don't know what there's a gap in between them. And uh, it's not a particularly difficult function class, but uh, um, you know there, there are um, 
these sort of pathological cases. Um, another question, um, maybe is there, this time I'll go in class, is there any question on this? Uh, did someone raise their hand? No, okay, so someone did uh, say stuff on Zoom, so I'll read this out. If we consider two points, to be specific, consider that the VC dimension, we consider the VC dimension third question in part two. Is that the one that's the, uh, with the two lines? Third question in part two. Maybe one of you can find it faster than me. Okay, yeah, so those are those, uh, uh, it's that picture that looks like, uh, Everything here is positive, I think. Okay. Now, if we arrange the points parallel to the x axis, something like this, maybe, then the points are shatterable. But if you place the two points parallel to the y axis, like this, then they may not be shatterable. So, are those two settings considered different or the same? So, uh, I'm going to ask a more, uh, take this question and generalize it. The general, the general version of this question is, uh, I have a function class and I consider two points, n points for some n, and I find that a certain configuration of the n points can be shattered and a certain other configuration cannot be shattered. Does this mean that the VC dimension is at least n? The answer is yes, because to show that the VC dimension is at least n, all we need is one set of size n. If you can produce even one set of size n that can be shattered, then it doesn't matter that some other set of size n cannot be shattered because we already have that. And you know, don't argue with me. Talk to Vapnik and Charon, Charon Venkir. Uh, but the definition says if one set or yeah, if one set of the required size can be shattered, then uh, the VC dimension is at least that much. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Um, and uh, those are two, yeah, uh, and someone else also answered the question much more compactly than uh, I did on Zoom. Maybe I should have read that first. Um, other questions? Yeah. I question about Adaboost. Question about Adaboost, but can we go over to questions about homework before we, yes. Can we use so that was the same question as before. Can you prove by pictures, take advantage of, Diagrams, but keep in mind that you have a 10 page page limit. And the second one is um, the risk with proof by pictures is that you may not be able to, uh, it's very tempting to kind of treat one example and pretend that it contains everything. So, in particular, be aware of the two places in this proof where you need to consider all possible cases here and here. And with proof by pictures, it's very tempting to replace both of these every with one. You show one picture and you're done. You need to prove that it can, 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 covers all cases. Yeah. I, I don't think so okay. For a word, it seems like I wish I had handwritten like words, but can you hand on pictures? Uh, as long as it is. Uh, it is reasonable. My TAs could not make it today, so they are not uh, here to uh, offer a counter opinion. So I'll just make a judgment call. As long as it's reasonable, provided reasonable is defined by the TA. Um, I know that uh, drawing pictures uh, programmatically can be tedious. Um, so, yeah. Uh, that's the that's the tricky part of the proof. You need to argue that no configuration of the points can exist other than the ones that you consider. That's the heavy part of the proof. Uh, it, sometimes it becomes very obvious. Uh, so the question for if uh, in case people in uh, on Zoom couldn't hear, for the less than case, how will I know that I have considered every set? Uh, or every possible configuration. Um, maybe I have not been able to consider some edge case. That's the that's going to be the part of the proof that you need to think a bit about. You need to prove that no other you know 
in fact, that's pretty much the proof. No points can exist outside of the configurations that you uh, describe. And uh, if you show that, and for each of the cases you describe, you produce a counter example in the form of a labeling, then you're done. So the, 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 that's why the upper bound has to be, it needs to be a little bit careful. Other questions? You had a question about AdBoost? Yeah, so I was wondering if there's an algorithm based on DC, like the uh, reverence, the DC of the AdBoost algorithm that you need to uh, I don't know of one. Um, I can't think of one right away. So maybe there is. I can look it up if you want. Um, I can't think of one right now. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. Okay. So in question one, uh, you say that every single image is supposed to be a hypothesis. Yes. How does that work? Isn't so, the hypothesis okay. an image classifier? Right. So, okay. Uh, this is the same question that came up, I think, uh, somewhere else also. I remember answering this. So the question was, in question number one, I say that every image is a hypothesis. How did images become hypothesis when, in fact, image classifiers are actually hypotheses? The reason I'm asking you to think of images as hypotheses uh, is because the question says the image, the printing press uses uh, image recognition system to check whether an image is correctly printed or not, which means there's a particular image that is correct and everything else is incorrect. So, oh, like that particular configuration of so you have the the uh, when a new image comes in, there is only one right image, and the function right, that detects yeah. it is the the function uh, is, is the is 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 one of the functions in the hypothesis. So there are as many functions as there are unique images. So that counts even when there's a human recognizing the image? Uh, yes, that's right. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, other questions about homework, Adaboos, about anything else? I don't see any conversation on Zoom, don't see any hands raised. I see a hand raised. Yes. For VC? Big was good. Yeah, for the yeah, if for the first question, you can have your answers in the big O notation. Yeah. But it has to be in the big big uh, O of all the right things. All right. So uh, if there are no other homework type questions, we're gonna move on. Today we're going to start a new unit. Um, we'll start looking at support vector machines. And the plan is we'll look at support vector machines and then we'll spend a bit of time on uh, inventing a learning algorithm for support vector machines that's based on optimization. And then generalize the idea of support vector machines and learning by optimization to something called the risk minimization principle, which is one of the most, uh, uh, shall we say, the dominant uh, ideas in machine learning today, where uh, in practice, we don't even, when I'm using machine learning today, I don't even think about uh, how to invent a learning algorithm because I call upon the risk minimization principle. Uh, if you're familiar with libraries like PyTorch and TensorFlow or JAX, they basically just, implement this idea. Uh, and a whole, a large, large part of uh, mo modern machine learning can be kind of encapsulated into that principle. So that's where we are building up to. But today we are going to look at support vector machines um, to kind of look back at how we got here. Um, a while back, we looked at linear models for classification. And then we kind of uh, took a, a step in a different direction and we asked, how do I know whether a learning algorithm is good? Turns out we can answer that question about how good is a learning algorithm in different ways. One way of answering that involves this uh, idea called online learning, or in particular, the one that we saw was mistake bound learning. Mistake bound learning meets on uh, linear classifiers, gives us algorithms like Perceptron. We saw Perceptron in class. There are other types of mistake bound algorithms, one of them, which is also kind of easy 
uh, but I did not really cover in the class is something called Veno. Then we went back to this question of how do I know whether a learning algorithm is good? And we answered the same question in a different way using PACT and agnostic learning using the PACT theory. Now, just like online learning meets linear models gave you um, a perceptron, PACT learning meets linear models gives you a whole bunch of other types of uh, learning algorithms. One of them is a support vector machine, and that's what we're going to look at. So support vector machine can be motivated from VC dimension and PACT theory, and it applies, it can be applied to linear models. It turns out there's like a, a super neat uh, kind of mathematically clever extension of these ideas to nonlinear models also, which we'll probably not touch upon, but uh, I can point you to it later on. But this is not the only way to answer the question of how good is a learning algorithm. In particular, after we are done with the risk minimization principle, we'll come back to this question of how good a learning algorithm is and answer it in a third way, which is uh, Bayesian uh, learning. And then once again, we'll ask what happens when Bay this idea of Bayesian learning meets linear models. And it turns out we get a new type of a learning algorithm called logistic regression. And uh, um, by that time, we'll be close enough to the end of the semester that uh, we can start thinking about the uh, finals and such things. But for now, let's talk about support vector machines. That's the goal for this unit. So I see that I can't see the chat anymore. Okay. Um, in, this, we, in this unit, we'll be talking about the core idea that drives support vector machines, which is training a classifier by maximizing the margin. Remember, remember margin that we encountered in perceptron, the same margin. Uh, so in the perceptron case, the intuition was uh, if the margin is larger, your classifier will make mistakes, uh, will make fewer mistakes because remember the mistake bound is R square over gamma square. So if gamma is small, a large number of mistakes is small. Turns out if margin is larger, it also uh, has other useful properties and we'll, the support vector machine is built on top of that. So after an intuitive sort of a overview of this idea, uh, we'll look at the training objective for SVMs. I'm, I think that's roughly where we'll probably, that's how far we'll get to today. And uh, somewhere, hopefully at the beginning, but if not somewhere in the middle of Thursday's lecture, uh, we'll look at how do we solve this optimization problem we set up? And we'll in particular look at this uh, idea of uh, stochastic gradient descent for support vector machines. And finally, um, ah, yes, so this thing about duals and kernels, unfortunately, I'm going to skip this year. Uh, this is a neat extension of uh, support vector machines for, for nonlinear models, but uh, in the interest of time and in the interest of being able to spend a little bit more time on other topics, I'm going to skip this. And uh, yeah, it pains me that I can't do this because it's uh, really fun stuff. Anyway, so let's uh, let's talk about maximizing the margin. Let's talk about training by maximizing the margin. Uh, in particular, let's go back to VC dimensions again because uh, this is like a natural sort of a stepping stone here. What we know is uh, if we have M example, then with probability one minus delta, with high probability, assuming delta is small, the true error of the classifier, the generalization error of the classifier H that is uh, trained on these N examples and has a training error of error S is bounded by the training error plus this expression here, which is uh, uh, among other things, a function of the VC dimension of the hypothesis class. And the lesson here is if your VC dimension is small, this bound here is tight. So your training error is a good sort of a, 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 a your estimate, or at least it's not too far off from the generalization error. You have some sense of how good your classifier will be in the future. So lower VC dimension gives a tighter bound. So lower VC dimension is a, a, a classifier that has a lower VC dimension is a better classifier to explore, or a hypothesis space that has lower VC dimension is better one to explore. So we know that. Um, we don't need to actually look at the, the, the actual 
form of that function. It's just that the function of VC dimension such that lower uh, VC dimension gives you a smaller number. So that's the first thing that we know. Another thing that we also know is that the VC dimension of linear classifiers in D dimensions is D plus one. Right? So does this mean that all linear classifiers are the same? Let me uh, uh, let me kind of ask this question in a slightly different way using an example. We've already encountered this idea of the margin of uh, a hyperplane. For this particular hyperplane, the margin is the distance to the closest example. Uh, so for a particular hyperplane and a data set, we can we can at least uh, uh, conceptually we can calculate its margin by considering every example, find how far it is, and then uh, find the distance uh, and take the one that has that's closest and that distance is the margin. Now consider the same data set and let's say we have two classifiers, H1 and H2. Both H1 and H2 perfectly separate the plus and the minus. But it turns out that H1 has a lower margin than H2. In case the picture is not that clear, this quantity is less than this quantity here. So the question for you is, if, if these are the only two classifiers that you had to make a choice from, which one would you pick? And why? Someone who's not, uh, yes. Uh, and what is that? So the, the, the answer is, um, sorry, I forgot your name. Yeah. Sam. Sam says that uh, uh, H2 might be better because there is more space on each side of the classifier. Here things are tighter. But follow up question. So what if there's more space? Why is that good? So, so essentially the answer is that uh, because there is more room, it's possible that a future example that comes in, even though it's on the wrong, you know, it, it has a little bit more room to be wrong. Uh, and it, it, as a result, it can the more the, among all the classes among these two classifiers, H two will generalize better because it will get fewer of these noisy examples wrong. Potentially noisy doesn't have to be noisy. If, you, if I put a plus here, doesn't have to be noisy. If I put a plus here, it's still not noisy. But this plus is on the wrong side of the classifier. Whereas that thing, if I got my picture right, would be somewhere here. It will still be okay. So there's a little bit more room for the points to be uh, in this gap between uh, the, the, the labels. And we have no reason to believe that there won't be any points in that gap, just because the training data does not have them. I think it's, I don't know, just consider that it's true and we think that the error and talking with clock running error is equal. Yes, so here we are assuming that uh, the two labels are equal. Of course, that's not always the case. Um, uh, you know, imagine that uh, you have a classifier that's making a cancer diagnosis. Uh, maybe there is uh, uh, one label is more precious than the other. There's a question on uh, uh, Zoom. Isn't there infinite space on either side? Yes, there is infinite space. So the number of points from here to here is infinite. Yes, but we can ask what's the probability that a point will lie in this gap versus the probability that it will lie in that gap. So we can still talk about uh, points being in in the in the uh, in that zone that does not have any training data, and there is more room. As a result, it's uh, uh, there's like a better margin of safety. So the, a new example that's not from the training set uh, might be misclassified if the margin is smaller. Okay, so here we have just looked at two classifiers. One, you know, one that has a smaller margin, another that has a larger margin. Instead of looking at two classifiers, let's uh, abstract things out a little bit. Consider all possible classifiers 
whose margin is this much here. So, you know, you could have this one and then another model could be something like, say, there's a line here whose distance is exactly the same. So let's call this H3. And so this distance is exactly the same as this one. So you can think of many, many, an infinite number of classifiers that have the same margin as H1. Similarly, you can think of an infinite number of classifiers that have the same margin as H2. Uh, intuitively, since larger margins are better, consider two linear classifiers or two families of linear classifiers, two sets. Capital H1 is all linear classifiers that have a margin gamma 1. Capital H2 is all linear classifiers that have a margin gamma 2. And suppose we know that gamma 1 is more than gamma 2. So every classifier in H1 has a margin that is more than any classifier in H2. The claim is that the entire set of functions H1 is better for generalizing. Why? Because of the same argument. If uh, this the H1 here is better than H2, all functions that look, no, H2 is better than H1 here. I messed up the number, numbering. The H2 here is better than H1. Every classifier that has a larger margin than H1 is better than H1. Questions about this? Just sort of an intuitive idea. We haven't um, really, uh, I haven't told you why. This is the case, but is there any uh, thoughts about this intuition? If you want to know why, rather than me proving it, we can just ask Vapnik who proved a theorem. The thing is, when I told you that the VC dimension of linear classifier is d plus one. That is true, but uh, if all linear classifiers have a VC dimension d plus one, then this statement does not make sense. How can one set of class, is there anything in the VC dimension that can tell us that capital H1 is better than capital H2? What Vapnik said is, suppose you have a data set and let's say you have uh, um, capital H is the set of all linear classifiers that perfectly separates the training data by a mark with a margin gamma. Then the VC dimension is less than or equal to the minimum of R square over gamma square and D plus one. We don't have to worry about why this is the case, but let's kind of examine this expression. What is R and gamma? R is the same, uh, capital R is the same thing that we saw in the perceptron. It's the radius of a circle that contains all the data. Gamma is the same thing that we saw in perceptron. It's the margin of the data. And the VC dimension of this hypothesis class is the minimum of two things, R square over gamma square plus one or D plus one, whichever one is smaller, that the, the VC dimension is less than that. What this means is if you have two hypothesis classes, H1 and H2, and really what we are saying is VC dimension, not, not this is not a formal statement, but is roughly inversely proportional to gamma square because there's that minimum and all that. So if you have a smaller margin, then the VC dimension becomes, sorry, if you have a larger margin, then the VC dimension becomes smaller. As a result, so going back to the earlier point about the generalization error is training error plus some function of VC dimension. What we know now is the VC dimension of linear classifiers is not just is is not just d plus one. It is related to the margin for a particular data set. And if you have a smaller, a larger margin, then you have a smaller VC dimension. This is the reason why you we prefer linear classifiers that have a larger margin because they will tend to generalize better in the future. Any questions about uh, any of this stuff? Yeah. Um, it's going to take a bit more time to go through that. For now, just take this as a fact. The intuition is uh, if you're, 
the the data is well r square is easy okay the way to think about r square is you're really zooming in and out into the data so that so you you can if you set r equals one you basically take a certain scale of the data you want to make the vc dimension uh data scale in very that's r the gamma square the intuition is really uh, this picture here if you have a smaller margin there are more classifiers that can sorry if you have a larger margin there are fewer classifiers that can fit if i allow a margin that's smaller you can have more classifiers that perfectly separate the data imagine that i have i allow a classifier a margin of some small let me use a different color some small epsilon here now i can rotate this line along many ways and then along all the points there are more linear classifiers that have a smaller margin there are fewer linear classifiers that have a larger margin that's the intuition I mean, we are talking about infinite sets here, so it's not really right to say that, but that's roughly a way of thinking about it. So what we have here is the following thing. Larger margin means lower VC dimension. That's what uh, this theorem tells us. The, uh, by the way, the, this VAPNIC is the same VAPNIC as the V in VC. Um, Lower VC dimension means that there's a better generalization bound. So larger margin implies better generalization. So here's a way of uh, way to think about learning. Find a linear classifier that finds the largest possible margin for a data set. So this gives us a new goal for learning. Rather than trying to just classify the training data perfectly, uh, in which case you may end up overfitting or you may end up finding a classifier that's correct, but really, really close to one of the data points. And as a result, makes mistakes in the future. The agenda here is we want to not only perfectly classify the training data, we want to classify the training data perfectly using a classifier that has the margin that is as large as possible. The largest possible margin for this training data. Question about anything that we've covered today so far. The rest of today's lecture and hopefully just today, but maybe a bit of uh, Thursday, will be taking this idea and converting it into an optimization problem. So before we start diving into the math, are there any questions about the intuition? And I'll leave this uh, thing here while you're thinking of questions. So there is a question that uh, does this mean that perceptron just works better for 2D examples? Um, I do not understand why. Can you explain that? As you are typing this, I'll wait for other questions also. Oh, I see. So, okay, okay, okay. So the question was, uh, does, this, does this statement here uh, mean that perceptron, well, you're thinking perceptron, let's just say linear classifier, are better for two dimensional data points because if you have only two dimensions, then this quantity is two, so the VC dimension is less than three. So VC dimension is lower, you get better generalization. Does this mean that uh, the linear classifiers in two dimensions are better than linear classifiers in three dimensions or 14 dimensions? And the answer is these things may not be directly comparable, which we need to think about the problem that we are solving, maybe there's a certain problem for which we cannot do fewer than 14 features. So we cannot help having a linear classifier that is uh, uh, that is that operates in a lower than a certain dimensionality. But on the other hand, um, if you can reduce the dimensionality of the data and the model does do well, then you might generalize better. This is also a more intuition for, this is also like a justification for feature selection or dimensionality reduction because if you can operate with if you can train a model with fewer features uh, you might end up generalizing better because of this VC dimension type argument if possible it's not necessary that it's always the case and uh, uh, definitely in most real world data sets we don't have a very clear handle on feature selection or how to pick the right features so it doesn't always uh, 
play out well in real data. Yeah. So modern things are it seems like modern things get outliers in the data set. So it's saying we more concerned about modern to average the data that it's using up. Well, actually, margin is not about fitting the outliers. Margin is about being as conservative as possible with respect to making uh, misclassifying the data point. We will see that uh, there uh, that doesn't quite work, and so there is what we actually call SVM, which we will hopefully get to by the end of today. It takes care of that in a sort of a natural uh, way. So. When I come to that, let's come back to that. Other questions? If not, I'm going to assume that all of you are on board with this agenda and we will start uh, filling up the slide with maps. All right, so the next thing here, now that we've all, we all agree that training by maximizing the margin is a good idea, um, because Vapnik told us so. Let's uh, make this, uh, let's, you know, bring this to life. So just to kind of recap where we are, lower VC dimension um, is better for generalization. And Vapnik says the VC dimension inversely uh, depends on the margin, which means larger margin gives lower VC dimension, which in turn gives better generalization. So larger margin gives better generalization. So the goal of training is to increase the margin as much as possible. Let's, let's uh, look at this margin a bit. Let's look at the geometry of a linear classifier. Uh, so we have a data set of negative and positive points. And uh, here I have a line that separates the two classes. The equation of this line, and all of this is in two dimensions. This is mostly to kind of give you uh, this intuitive idea of a very important thing that I'm going to bring up uh, from this. So let's say that uh, we have a line uh, B plus W1 X1 plus W2 X2 equals zero. That separates this uh, thing, these two uh, thing, uh, these two uh, uh, groups of points. Uh, let's say this is X, this is X1 and this is X2. Now. Given this classifier, at prediction time, when a new example comes in, or even during training, if we need to make a prediction, what we do is we look at, given the features x1 and x2, we multiply by the, the features by the weight and uh, add the bias b, and only look at the sign of that quantity. So we have a number and we look at the sign of that quantity. And it's important that only the sign matters and not the actual value. So if I multiply this whole thing by 100, or a thousand or 0 0.0001 or any positive number, the sign is not going to change. And we're going to take advantage of that later. So that's the first uh, thing I want you to just keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is what is the margin? I said the margin is the distance to the closest data point. In two dimensions, we know that the distance is the absolute value of B plus W1X1 plus W2X2 divided by uh, the norm of the w's square root of w1 square plus w2 square. Instead of writing absolute value, I can say, uh, okay, let's pretend that this classifier perfectly classifies the data and let's say this side is positive. So for an example of this type, b plus w1 x1 plus w2 x2 is going to be greater than zero. And this label is also, let's call this uh, y, is also plus one. So the product of those two things is going to be greater than zero. So for an example on the other side, B plus W1 X1 plus W2 X2 is going to be less than zero and the label is minus one. Once again, the product of these two things is going to be positive. So this times Y is going to be positive. So rather than writing absolute value, I'm going to write Y times uh, the score. And this is just another way of writing the absolute value of uh, a training uh, exam, the score for training example. So that's the numerator. And the denominator is uh, rather than staying in two dimensions, I decided to call this the norm of the weight factor of the weight. So I, I'm, I've, I've done nothing here other than just 
uh, lay out a bunch of notation. Okay, and hopefully all of this is uh, uh, familiar to everyone. So let's now start uh, making this a little bit. Uh, let's start changing this thing, this a little bit. So the first thing to note is that we only care about the sign of the the scores. So I could change the equation of the line might look superficially different instead of having b w1 and w2 i can have all of them or i can multiply them by a thousand they are all the same line so all these three things are the equations of the same line right uh, as long as we multiply or divide by any positive number why because we only care about the sign of the of the score and not the magnitude so the sign does not change we multiply by a negative number, then we change the sign, so that's not allowed. So that's the first thing. We are we can we can multiply and divide these things by any positive number. Before we move to margins, any question about this? Yes. Yes. We had just one example. Uh, on the side of the data, so uh, wouldn't the entire concept of margin change? Yeah, for sure, yes. For now, actually, that's a good catch. For now, let's pretend that the data is linearly separable. Let's pretend that we know that the data is linearly separable. Then we'll deal with the other case afterwards. So, not the distance between a negative and a positive, but the smallest distance, half of that actually. Okay. Yes, half of that distance. Yes. In fact, I have a definition of a margin right here. So it's the distance of the closest point from the hyperplane. Um, let's kind of go back here. I'm going to rewrite this quantity as y times w transpose x divided by, let's put a b here so that I, right? So I have that. I, this is in some this gives the, the, what I've written at the bottom is the distance between any point x comma y with a label y and this hyperplane. Remember the definition of the margin. It's simply the 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 distance of the closest point to that hyperplane. So if I enumerate all the points in my data and take the minimum among all the data points of this expression, that gives me the margin, right? I essentially, I compute this distance, I compute this one, I compute every possible distance, and I take the smallest one. That's the margin. Um, so rather than writing it, uh, rather than me writing it, there's a typeset version of that here. The margin of the hyperplane is simply the distance of the closest point from the hyperplane. So I can write this as gamma w comma b. And our goal is to maximize this margin. Uh, among all the weight vectors and the biases that exist in this space, I need to find the one, I need to find the weights and the bias that maximizes the margin. And if we are able to find that particular weight vector that maximizes this expression, which is really this expression, then we can, uh, Vapnik assures us that this will generalize as well as it, 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 it can. Um, there's a question, is the minimum over i the same as the arg min over x comma y? It's not arg min, it's just min over x comma y. So the I said min in the previous slide, I said min over x, y, and I have x and y here. And here, instead, I just have an i, the minimum over i, but I put the, I have x, i, and y, i. So this is a good time to introduce a little bit of notation or just introduce a few words that you might see in the literature. Uh, this expression that I'm calling the margin is sometimes called the geometric margin. Why? Because this is the margin that we learn about in geometry. So, um, sometimes we only care about the numerator without worrying about the norm of the weight vector. That quantity is sometimes called the functional margin, just the name. Any questions about what you've seen so far? 
if there are no questions let's uh, charge ahead so just to kind of uh, recap where we are our goal is to maximize the margin maximizing the margin is going to give us better generalization so the goal of learning is to maximize this expression here is to solve that uh, optimization problem among all possible weights and biases find the one that maximizes gamma wb uh, gamma wb itself is the uh, minimum distance to any data point from that hyperplane we are of course assuming that our data is linearly separable there's a question Here. Oh yeah, an earlier version of the slide uh, did say max, and uh, I will I fixed it this morning, but I haven't uploaded it to the website. Yes, that's right. This uh, this used to say max, but that's not right because we want the the margin is the closest. Uh, point in yes, that's right. All right. Okay. So now um, let's go back to this picture again. Remember, I only care about the sign of the score and not the magnitude. So if I define the scores to be this thing here and I define them. I I can uh, compute the margin uh, of the data uh, by considering all data points and finding the minimum over that expression. But that is very much tied to this particular choice of W and B. What if I divide the W and the B by some number C? Let's call, let's divide them all by C. So I have. another weight vector it's another weight vector that has the exact same that represents the exact same hyperplane and as a result it should have the exact same margin right so i can it's the margin of that particular weight vector will look something like this i've done nothing really other than just divide both numerator and denominator by some number c some positive number c okay so it's these two things are identical but now let's, but at least superficially, this weight vector this these two weight vectors look different because the parameters here are b, w1 and w2 and the parameters for the second one are b divided by c, w1 divided by c and w2 divided by c. These superficially, they look like different sets of numbers. Now, this is an ambiguity for our learner because they represent the same hyperplane, but written in different ways. And this means that the learner has to make this choice between these two things and an infinite number of such things, when in fact they all represent the same thing and it just adds to the complexity of learning. Before we move on, any does that, does that argument uh, convince you? So we, the point is, we can choose the value of C to be some number so that we force the learner not, we remove that choice from the learner because it's really not, it was never really a choice. They represent the exact same line. So if I choose the value of C carefully and fix it to be a certain number, then that uh, the learner does not have to kind of uh, choose between this and this because it does not even that that choice is taken away from. It. So we have this extra degree of freedom. Uh, the learner has this extra degree of freedom that is meaningless. So we might as well take it away from them. What would be a good way to? Uh, what would be a good choice for this C? You can think of different choices, but there's one that actually helps a lot. Suppose I scale the C. So that the numerator of this expression is equal to one uh, for the closest point. For just the closest point, the numerator is equal to one. In other words, if if I set the value of c to be 
some number, I'm not going to talk about what that number is, such that this numerator becomes one, then what happens to the margin? The margin just becomes one divided by the norm of the weights of that new classifier. This is the part that most people, when they first see this argument, it trips them a little. So I'm going to pause here for a minute and uh, wait for questions. So there is already a question. Are we picking C to restrict the size of the hypothesis space? We are actually not picking C to, actually choosing C does not change the hypothesis space at all because choosing C can be seen as a way of zooming in and out of the data, uh, scaling the data, if you will. Or another way of thinking about this is choosing C only uh, considers the fact that if, if I have this vector here, let's say, um, let's say W1, W2, and B, I'm going to write it like this. Let's say I have 1, 1, and 1. This is the best classifier that we had uh, to begin with. This is the ground truth. Well, this corresponds to the line X1 plus X2 plus 1 equals 0, 1, 1, 1. Consider now another line, which is half, half, and half, which corresponds to the line x1 divided by 2 plus x2 divided by 2 plus half equals 0. Turns out these two are the same line. I, 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 right? I mean, there, it makes no difference between uh, these two choices of uh, parameters. So by picking C, it's not that I'm restricting the hypothesis space. In fact, I'm making the job of the learner a little bit easier because now in had I not done that, the learner would have to make a choice between this and this. When in fact, that choice is actually not even a real choice because they both correspond to the exact same line. So the learner would have to choose between two different ways of writing the same uh, expression when in fact, it should not be forced to. So instead, what we do is we choose a C uh, in a careful way such that that particular spurious ambiguity is taken away from the learner. And it turns out along the way, we will also be able to write down a neat optimization problem. That choice of C, and uh, this may seem like a non-trivial, non like an unintuitive choice of C, but we, you'll be able to appreciate it in a little bit. The choice of C that we'll use is the one that makes the numerator for the closest point equal to one. Question, yes. Yeah, so uh, the, that is, we are drawing this, uh, taking the closest negative and the positive almost because it has to be along a certain almost. There is a certain, it turns out that uh, what you just described in high dimensions is a legitimate way of learning a support vector machine also. Um, there's an algorithm for that. Uh, we won't be covering that, but you are almost there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, what we really wanted to do was actually what we have done here is actually to get rid of the X from the margin. Notice this expression is independent of X mathematically. No, well, we'll come there in a minute. C is actually going to go away very soon. C is also going to go away very soon. Uh, other questions? I can tell you that when I first saw this, it made no sense to me. So if you are on that, if you are, if you feel that way, then uh, uh, yeah, you should do what I do. You know, stick with it, and eventually you'll be teaching it to others. Um, it's it's a kind of a subtle argument. It's a subtle argument because uh, I have still not told you why we are doing this. So all I have told you is if I'm able to find retroactively, imagine that I have you know, uh, infinite foresight. I find that value of C such that the closest point uh, uh, that defines the margin has this functional margin, that's the numerator, equal to one. 
I consider the, that particular value of C, and then retroactively I go back and divide my weight vectors by uh, the this weights by the C, and then I get my new weight vector. Turns out I do have a new weight vector because W1 by C, W1 divided by C is a real number. W2 divided by C is a real number. Who says that I care about W1 and W2? Maybe I'm just going to call this this thing the new W1 and this whole thing the new W2. And it's just some number, right? We don't know what W1 was. We don't know what C is. Why do I care about W1 and C when all I care about is the ratio between them? Might as well just learn the ratio uh, of W1 divided by C, W2 divided by C, and so on. And these are my new parameters. W1 divided by C is, I'm just calling it W1. W2 divided by C, I'm just calling it W2. So my new learning goal, or I called it U, U1 and U2 here. So let's just stick to that notation. I'm going to call this number U1. So let's uh, clear out some of the mess so that this thing here I'm going to call u1, this thing here I'm going to call u2. And if I knew u1 and u2 and b divided by c, I have a classifier. I don't need to know the actual numbers of uh, values of c and such things. So I just I can just directly learn u1 and u2, uh, and that becomes my new learning problem. So I, I just, instead of calling it U1 and U2, I just call it W1 and W2. The only thing that we need to keep in mind is now that we have chosen this value of C carefully and all that, the margin is no longer that old, that old expression. It's just one divided by the square root of W1 square plus W2 square, where W1 and W2 are the new weights. And uh, if we can find that margin, we are done. So let me recap and uh, then I'll pause for questions, okay? The margin of the hyperplane is simply the distance of the closest point from uh, the hyperplane. So it is this quantity here, y times w transpose x plus b divided by the norm of w. I can't calculate that over all the data points and I find the minimum over the data points and that is the margin of the data. Our goal is to find a classifier that maximizes the margin of the data. But we only care about the sign of the W and the B. Uh, sorry, not the sign of W and B, but the sign of, this is not right. We only care about the sign of the dot product of W transpose X plus B uh, and not the actual value. So instead what we do is we, we pretend that we can go over uh, uh, we find the margin and then retroactively find the closest point and rescale the Ws and the Bs such that this expression here, the numerator, becomes one for the closest point. There is that one closest point, or maybe in practice, it's actually going to be a set of closest points that defines the margin. We're going to rescale the Ws and Bs so that that particular, for those points, the margin value is uh, uh, the, the numerator is one. It will still be the lowest margin because for all the others will get rescaled appropriately. So, in other words, maximizing this expression is equivalent to saying I want to maximize the weights such, such that uh, uh, maximize uh, over all the weights, uh, the one over the norm of W. Why? Because if I set this equal to one for the closest point, then I'm left left with one over norm of W. but subject to the constraint that the closest point has a functional margin of one, such that the, the, the margin of the closest point is equal to one. Question? Comments? You can just tell me that you're very confused. You're laughing, so are you? <laughs> yes. So I was just making a constraint and making a uh, we are setting up a constraint. We are, we are adding this constraint so that the learning problem has a unique solution because there's going to be only one such uh, function. And it also helps us set up a well-formed optimization problem 
right uh, like which we will do next under this there's a constraint in this particular setting what is the setting the absolute score or the functional margin of the closest point is uh, equal to one so among all my weight vectors i want to find the one that maximizes one over the norm of w subject to the constraint that for the closest point this numerator expression becomes one that's going to be my optimization problem what i just said i'm going to uh, or the literally the thing that i just said in english i'm going to write it in math my goal actually let me write it in math first and then so my goal is to maximize the margin over all the weights such that so those of you who have not seen uh, optimization they uh, typically optimization problems tend to look like this you have maximization this is just such that the closest point has Now, what is the functional margin? The functional margin was simply the numerator of that distance expression. So let's kind of fill this up uh, with words. So the functional margin is simply y times w transpose x plus b. Just the numerator. What's the margin? The margin is 1 divided by the norm of w. And that's because we've already assumed that the distance, the the, the uh, this this for the closest point, this uh, distance is equal to one. So rather instead of that, I can write maximize over oh shoot, this is not right. Maximize over W and B. One over the norm of W such that for I'll rewrite this for the closest point. Y times W transpose X plus B equals one. Rather than saying, let's now just massage this a little bit. Rather than maximizing one over the norm, I'm going to replace this, this expression with minimize just the norm. Those two are the same, right? When maximizing one divided by the norm is the same as minimizing the norm. That part is easy. Let's now look at for the closest point. If for the closest point, y times w transpose x plus b equals one, then for every other point, it should be more than one. Because this is by definition, the, the point that is closest, that has the lowest value of y times w transpose x plus b. So this, instead of this, I can write for all points, x i comma y i, y i w transpose x plus b is greater than or equal to one. Now, if you only look at the blue stuff, this thing here, oh no. And this is actually a well-defined optimization problem, which it turns out this kind of a problem has been studied by uh, people who study optimization for decades, and they just know how to solve this stuff. That's really the point of this exercise. The point of this exercise was to take that goal that we had of maximizing the margin and converting it into a form that somebody else has already solved. I'm going to write the same thing in a slightly cleaner way. My goal is to minimize over all the weights. And here I'm ignoring the bias terms because I'm assuming that the bias has become, has become a feature. Uh, like 
you do with the uh, perceptron and such things. Um, the goal is to minimize overall weight half W transpose W. This is the same as half norm of W square. Why, why do I, how did the square come in? Because it turns out having a square allows me to kind of uh, write, it gives me a slightly more stable optimization um, because the norm of W is defined as the square root of something like that, right? And having a square root inside an optimization problem is a nightmare. And instead I can just square both sides I see my norm of W just looks like five lines. I can square both sides. And when this quantity gets minimized, this quantity also gets minimized. So I can just stick to that. Why do I have a half? Because I'm going to take a great derivative very soon. And uh, just like you did with least mean squares, I have a half so that I don't have to keep track of a two later on. That's just the objective here. Such that for every example, for the ith example, uh, sorry, for every example indexed by i, y times w transpose xi is greater than or equal to 1. Minimizing the, this expression gives us the max uh, of one, the 1 over the norm of w. The second expression says, the, the, the constraint says, uh, this is true for every example. For every example, the uh, the the functional margin y times w transpose x should be at least one. In particular, it should be true for the one that's closest to that, uh, the example that's closest to the hyperplane. For the example that's closest to the hyperplane, it won't be greater than or equal to one, it will be exactly equal to one. And that's what we want because that is the same one that we had in the numerator of the margin. This optimization problem is called the hard support vector machine. Okay, uh, I think I missed a question. So let's see if I can go back. For the blue version to be equivalent, do we, okay, well, the blue version is here. For the blue version to be equivalent, do we need that y times w transpose x plus v equals one for some x comma y? That's right. In fact, it will be equal to one for the x comma y that is, the closest to the separator. In particular, the example that's closest to the separator will have equality. For all other points, it will be greater than one. So this expression is called the hard support vector machine. And the hard part here is not because it's difficult, but because uh, uh, we assume hard separability of the data. We'll not worry about how to solve this optimization problem for now. We'll look at how to solve it uh, on Thursday. Uh, any questions about the problem optimization problem itself? The way we got here. Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. So how did we go from here? Right? So maybe I can draw a little map to uh oh. There's something. Um Oh, there's another question. Couldn't just find something bigger than, uh, can, can I answer this? Uh, because it's a smaller question. Um, or actually, you know what? I think both questions are roughly the same thing. Uh, it turns out, so I'm gonna go through this map again. Uh, and I'll, Jackson, I'll answer your question once we get to that. So the first thing that we did was uh, define the margin of the weights. is min over i, y, and the goal is max over all weights and biases, right? This was the first step. The next thing that I did was to note that there is this extra degree of freedom. We can scale w and b by any positive number c. So the, in other words, the margin of w and b is going to be exactly the same of, as the margin of uh, w divided by c and b divided by c. Uh, 
I can skip. Oh, wow. This is, why didn't any of you tell me that this is China? So we have that. So we can scale the points by, I know that your eyesight is much better than mine, but you know, if you can't read, just tell me. Because uh, that was tiny. Uh, <laughs> so we can do that. Then what we can do is the, the, then the third observation is pick C such that for the closest point, in particular, by, by closest point, I mean the point that actually defines the margin. So let's say that uh, the min let's call this minimizer is some x i comma y i some pair of some uh, example la uh, labeled example so for the closest point x i comma y i we have uh, y i w transpose i plus b is equal to one if we do that by doing that the, what we can ensure is this implies that the margin of weights and uh, of w comma b, which is exactly the same as the margin of w divided by c and b divided by c, is one over the norm of w divided by c for that particular choice of uh, c. Okay. Instead of calling w divided by c and b divided by c, I'm just going to call this thing and this thing the thing that we care about learning. Let's call this u and let's call this b hat. And in fact, let me not call it u and b hat. Let me just call it w and b with some abuse of notation. This is a new w and a new b. And the next thing I'll do is just stop saying new and we just have w and b. So now the goal of learning and it's getting smaller, I see, and I hope you can, it's still legible. Um, but legible is a tall ask. I hope it's at least visible. Um, so this means that uh, the goal of learning is to maximize this. It was the same as before. It's to maximize this quantity here. That quantity is the same as this, which is the same as this. So, but I also said that instead of W divided by C, I'm just going to call it W. So it's to maximize the norm of W. But we're not free to choose the W arbitrarily such that, oh no, not maximize the norm of W, maximize one divided by the norm of W, such that this condition holds for the closest point. You can see the box, so that's good enough, right? What does it mean for that condition to hold for the closest point? It's the same as saying for every point, it, the y times w transpose x plus b should be at least one. In particular, for the closest point, it will be one. And that's the answer to your question, uh, Jackson. We set up the optimization problem such that for all i, y i, w transpose x i, I'm going to stop, stop writing the b simply because uh, I'm assuming it's folded into the bias, into the weights is at least equal to one. Now, from here to what we saw on the previous slide is a easy step because instead of maximizing the norm of W, I can, sorry, maximizing the one over the norm of W, I can minimize just the norm of W and that gives you the minimization. Yes. Are you talking about the same scale W and scale W? Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, no. Uh, in, in point B, no, it's not a scale W and the scale B. It's the old W and old B. I'm rescaling such that it doesn't be, uh, oh, I see, I see what you mean. This is the scale W and scale B. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Such that, yes. Because that's the thing that we are learning eventually. Yeah, it's exactly good catch. It's a scale W and the scale B. We are at 145, so I will stop here. Uh,
what I would like you to do before, uh, you know, you have your homework and all that, but uh, that after the 20 minutes or so that it takes you to finish your homework, uh, what I want you to do is to revisit this argument and think of why this will fail. In particular, think of what happens when your data is not linearly separable. And that's the thing that we'll try to fix in the next lecture. I have office hours now, so you can, if you have any questions about any of these things, we can meet in the in my office.